So my idea of three big stories in about three minutes is a great idea, but some days it's absurdly painful. So I give myself the freedom to expand if necessary. And today we have to go over five big stories. So the first one is a carryover from the last couple of days where uh, Macron said this and then Schultz said that. And so Macron uh, didn't take off the table uh, boots on the ground of NATO forces in Ukraine. The rest of NATO went ballistic, no pun intended, and said, oh, we're, we're not going to do that. That's not the agreement. That And Olaf Scholz uh, also was one of those saying that. But he was saying that while he was also talking about why he's not delivering the Taurus missile because it has to be controlled in Germany and that would be creating a problem because then Germany would be implicated in something being sent into Russia. Now, that's kind of an excuse. I'll be talking to a German professor shortly about this to understand what's going on. And uh, hopefully we'll have some more understanding of that. But OK, UK says that Ukraine's business, how donated cruise missiles are used. That's the right position. We gave it to them. They shot it. It's not us. Britain said on Wednesday that how you, uh, Kiev uses donated cruise missiles is the business of the armed forces of Ukraine. It's the right position. The UK, along with other allies, is providing a range of equipment to Ukraine to help it counter Russia's illegal and unprovoked aggression. German leader Schultz saying on Monday that Berlin could not emulate Britain and France in sending long-range weapons to Ukraine and supporting the weapon, weapon systems deployment. So again, he, he vetoed the idea of Taurus but allowed other things. He has repeatedly refused to provide German Taurus missiles, fearing they could be used to hit targets deep within Russia. This is a very long-range weapons, and what the British and French are doing in terms of targeting and supporting targeting cannot be done in Germany, Schultz said. In my view, it would be unjustifiable if we were to participate in targeting in the same way. They don't have to participate. They can just turn over the weapons, train the Ukrainians on it, and turn it over, but I think this is more of an excuse than a reason. If you know something I don't know, please put it in the comments, and thank you. Okay, story number two. Zelensky and the Moldovan president discuss events in Transnistria, tools to counter Russians' influence. So Zelensky meets with Sandu at a meeting. Um, they're already meeting at a meeting, and they're discussing recent events in Transnistria. Thank you for your words of support. We are absolutely on your side. We support you and your people, Zelensky said. Well, what's he talking about here? Well, he's talking about this. This is today in RT, NATO applicants breakaway region asks Moscow for help. Well, remember, that's the same song sheet that the Russians sang from the first time when they entered um, into Ukraine and the second time in 2022. Russia has pledged to address Transnistria's plea while Moldova has condemned the call as propaganda declaration. Transnistria, an unrecognized republic that split from Moldova in the early 90s and asked Russia on Wednesday for help amid mounting pressure. The call was made at a Congress of Transnistrian legislators at all levels, which adopted a declaration on the matter. The lawmakers asked Moscow to take measures to protect Transnistria amid mounting pressure from Moldova, stressing that nearly half of the 450,000 people living in the unrecognized country are Russian citizens. Hmm? How are they Russian citizens? Well, they're Russian speakers at least, and so that somehow provides justification to Moscow. Moscow promptly reacted to the call for help, promising to address it shortly. Quote, protecting the interests of Transnistria residents, our compatriots, is one of our priorities. All requests are always carefully considered, unquote, Russia's foreign ministry said in a statement. The Russian parliament will evaluate Transnistria's plea as soon as the document actually reaches Moscow. Konstantin Zatlin, a senior lawmaker in the lower chamber, the state Duma, told RIA Novosti. Apparently, they don't have email there. The move has already been condemned by Moldova, which, of course, it would be. Now, I'm thinking Ukraine doesn't want a second front on the West, but if it were to kick off... I bet you they have a huge stockpile of artillery shells over the just over the border in Moldova, and that would be really handy right about now if you could grab it. Okay, turning our attention to America, this is story number three. Nearly two dozen European Parliament leaders urged Johnson to act on Ukraine aid. The leaders of 23 European 
parliaments are imploring Speaker Mike Johnson to take up and pass additional assistance for Ukraine amidst its war with Russia. Quote, we believe that thanks to your personal leadership, the Congress will demonstrate historic bipartisan unity in support of the collective effort to assist Ukraine. They wrote in an open letter, and here's the open letter with all these different parliaments and whatever. This was just yesterday. The plea comes as Ukraine repeatedly indicated it's running low on ammunition amid the ongoing war with Russia. They really are. That's why they had to get out of Dodge and Avdivka. They, they really do need this. This isn't joking. Johnson's office said in response that while Speaker Johnson believes we must confront Putin and is exploring steps to effectively do so, as he has said at the White House, his immediate priority is funding America's government and avoiding a government shutdown. They can avoid a government shutdown with a continuing resolution. They don't have to have this fight unless they choose to do that. And it's disingenuous to say anything other than that. Meanwhile, Biden officials are weighing giving Ukraine weapons without replacing U.S. stocks right away or waiting for Congress to provide the funding. So the Biden administration officials met on Tuesday at the Pentagon to discuss ways to fill some of Ukraine's urgent needs for artillery and ammunition quickly, including possibly drawing down U.S. stockpiles without replenishing them immediately or without waiting for more money from Congress, say two senior administrative officials and a congressional official. Well, that's something. I mean, that's that's pretty significant if they go and do that. The discussions reflect growing alarm in the administration that Ukraine is poised to run out of key weaponry in the next few weeks, including 155 millimeter artillery rounds and air defense munitions. Right. So they're spending like Patriot rounds. They're shooting down these planes, but they only have but so many Patriot missiles in order to shoot these planes down. And when they run out, it's going to be absolutely devastating if they do run out. Okay, but after months of fiercely protecting stockpiles in the name of military readiness, Pentagon officials are now warming to the idea of accepting some risk to U.S. readiness in order to keep Ukraine in the fight. That's the military brass is now shifting gears and going, you know, it's this desperate that they have to do this or it's going to be all over. The House is not expected to move on Ukraine aid until at least late March. So if you're looking for it to come like this week or next week, uh, it's probably not going to. But even if that happens, the process is not expected to be swift, given GOP opposition in the House to a Senate bill that passed earlier this month. Two congressional officials say that the goal is to pass Ukraine funding in the third week of March in order to sustain that country in its war against Russia, and they anticipate a vote by the end of March. If the House can't get funding passed by then, the administration can take the ammunition from U.S. stockpiles, quote, but, do not, uh, but to do that now would absolutely kill us, one congressional official said. No pun intended with the kill us, but yeah, I mean, they're in the midst of the negotiations, and again, this is a process, and it takes takes time. They don't need to do this right now, but if you're following how the process works, they have to be able to work through the process. But it, while well, they're saying don't, it'll kill us, it's actually killing Ukrainians right now. So this is absolutely tragic. Okay, next story. This is the last story, that, or second to last story. Yeah. Uh, Russian authorities are reportedly systematizing the adoption of deported Ukrainian children in Russia. This is absolutely horrible. I, I, every time I see anything about adopted children in, from Ukraine into Russia, I pay close attention to this. This is from the Institute of the Study of War. Russian opposition outlet Verska reported on February 27th that Russian authorities in Moscow Oblast created training programs for people potentially considering adopting illegally deported Ukrainian children in Russia. The program reportedly falsely conflates Ukrainian and Russian culture and reportedly tells participants that their main objective is to create a second homeland for Ukrainian children in Russia, that they will need to overcome difficulties in international differences. So we're going to wipe out their understanding of where they came from in Ukraine and rewrite the system. Participants of the training program must undergo undergo interviews in which Russian authorities ask if they have Ukrainian friends and relatives, and the ISW continues to access that this is basically genocide. I mean, that's what it amounts to. <sighs> okay, today is the ninth anniversary of Boris Nemtsov's death. Now, if you don't know who Nemtsov is, 
I, I didn't really have a good handle on this either when I was talking to Zach the Russian. By the way, go and watch the video from Zach the Russian. Our interaction just dropped today. Um, but last uh, Saturday, he and I sat down in a restaurant and we're just talking some things over and I was picking his brain. And um, he mentioned Nemtsov and I was like, Nemtsov, I mean, I, I could barely put any pegs to that name. And yeah, but you know, he was a bigger figure than Navalny at the time back in 2015, especially in Russia. He was killed on February 27th, 2015 in the center of Moscow. At the last years of his life, Nemtsov opposed Russia's invasion of eastern Ukraine. Before his murder, he was preparing a report called Putin War, which was published by his supporters after his death. So he was basically the Navalny of 2015, and but he was actually bigger than Navalny. And if that makes sense. Uh, and if you were in Russia, you would understand this, apparently. Ukraine's success is a chance for Russia. This is what he's what he has said. He was a Russian and he was supporting Ukraine. Ukraine's success is a chance for Russia. We have no right to behave like this against a friendly country. It's meaningless. It's insolence. He also said we must say no to war. We must say Russia and Ukraine without Putin. Glory to Russia. Glory to Ukraine. From an address to the Russian military, he said, quote, it's not your war. It's not our war. It's Putin's war for his power and money. It's a war of his billionaire accomplices. Remember, you are fighting and dying for them, not for Russia. He also said other things like Vladimir Putin is blanked in the head, you know, and Nemtsov was shot in the back on February 27th, 2015 in front of the Kremlin walls. In fact, close to Putin's office. Okay, last little thing, and that's this. This is the mess that gets made. This is the Ruski mirror. This is what happens when these things are applied in the way that they're applying them now. It just makes a big, big mess of the world. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you for the likes, the shares, the subscribes, and the coffees. Thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.